Hello, everyone, and welcome to session four of the massive open online course for the University of Nicosia's Masters in Digital Currencies. This is our seventh semester for this course. Uh, welcome, this is Andreas Antonopoulos, and I'll be answering the questions that you have posed over the last week in our forums, and also any live questions or follow-ups you may pose in the chat room as we speak. So, um, let's get started. Anna asks, Hello, Andreas. Is my understanding correct that only one public key can be generated from a private key? But many children private public keys can be generated from a parent private public key, respectively, such as in HD, hierarchical deterministic wallets. Or is it also possible to generate many public keys from one private key? This part isn't so clear. Could you give us some more detail, please? So, Svetlana, um, only one public key is generated from each private key. In fact, a public key is nothing more than a point on the elliptic curve that is generated by multiplying a generator point by a big number, which is the private key. So if you do multiplication, um, the result is always going to be the same. A single private key will always give you the same single public key correspondence. One private key will always generate the same single public key. Now, there are private keys that are special, and these are called extensible. Extensible public keys are twice the size of normal public keys. Uh, sorry, extensible private keys are twice the size of normal private keys. And that's because they include two components, a master private key and a chain code, which is used to construct chains of hierarchical deterministic keys private key can generate children, and those children correspond to public keys. So you can have a master private key that has children, and those children can have their own children, and so and so. And these children are private keys. And for each of these private keys, there exists one corresponding public key. A single extensible private key can generate a whole sequence uh, in fact, a whole tree of private keys that are also extensible, that can also generate children, and so on and so on, without any limitation as to death. And these keys can then each have a corresponding single public key. You can generate an infinite sequence of private keys, each corresponding to a single public key, so therefore an infinite sequence of public keys from a single master extensible private key. But a master extensible private key is not the same as a private key. It's a private key plus a chain code that allows you to generate more private keys, and that's why we call it an extensible private key. Uh, when you see that notated in base 58 encoding, it will start with XPRIV, XPRIV, extensible private key. It will generate extensible public keys called XPUB. A regular private key that is not extensible will start either with a 5, a K, or an L. Uh, that's the wallet import format of a private key. Long string of base 58 characters starting with a 5, a K, or an L. That is a regular private key. Private key that starts with a 5K or L, it only has one corresponding public key. If you have a private key that starts with XPRIV, it can generate a whole series of private keys and public keys in a tree. Susanna asks that it is possible to create scripts in order to make more complex Bitcoin transactions. What is the recommended way to create these scripts? Are there wallets that help with that? Not really. Um, creating custom scripts for a Bitcoin transaction is really a programmatic function for end users. And therefore, for creating these scripts, you're not using a wallet, you're using a software library, 
Um, or you might be using some kind of um, web-based software that helps encode these scripts, but very well de designed and developed. There are some that are good for doing very simple scripts, like, for example, multi-signature scripts, and for doing very simple types of uh, custom transactions, such as, for example, using lock time. Uh, one of my favorites, actually, Oinbin, O-I-N-B dot I-N. Oinbin is a web-based system, uh, runs entirely in JavaScript, JavaScript in your browser, and enables you to construct multi-sig addresses, as well as more complex scripts, lock time transactions, and construct and verify and transmit transactions created with these scripts. It's great for testing out ideas. It's great for uh, experimenting with the scripting language. Um, but of course, it does, it does require a detailed understanding. And it won't protect you from making a script that cannot be redeemed. So the problem with scripts, or a problem with scripts, is that when you create a script, and you send a payment to a script using a technology called pay to script hash or P2SH. What you're paying to is a hash. The network doesn't see the script until you try to spend it. If you construct a script that is broken, a script that cannot be redeemed, a script that has no answer that results in true, um, an unspendable script, you can quite happily send a payment to the hash of that script, and the network will accept and lock your payment script hash. And at that point, that money is lost forever, because there is no uh, redeem script and script that can unlock the amount you put behind the buggy script. You can create a buggy script, send money to it, and lose that money forever. So using advanced scripting, uh, you really need to be careful, and more importantly, you need to test. Before you send $100 or $100,000 to your fantastic new test script, how about sending a dollar and see if you can actually spend it and get it back? If you can, then maybe you can trust that script. Um, if you can't, then you only lost a dollar. Alex asks, how does a wallet generate a private key from a seed? What are the odds that two different wallets might generate the same seed? And what are the differences between BIP32, BIP39, and BIP44? All right, those are great questions, Alex. Uh, I'll tackle them one by one. How does a wallet generate a private key from a seed? There is a defined process. And that process is defined in BIP39 for BIP39 compliant seeds, whereby a wallet will first generate 128 bits of entropy. These 128 bits of entropy will be used to produce a series of words, a mnemonic phrase of 24 words. And these 24 words will be combined, perhaps with a password or passphrase, and they are hashed repeatedly using a key stretching algorithm called PBK DF2 and the HMAC 512 hash algorithm. So basically, what that means is your wallet generates some randomness, 128 bits of randomness. It maps that randomness onto some English words, or if you're using another dictionary, Japanese, Italian, or whatever words, but let's say English words, 24 English words, which become your backup recovery phrase. And you need to write this down. From that backup recovery phrase and an optional passphrase, the wallet will then repeatedly hash the addition of that phrase uh, through an algorithm called HMAC 512. Um, and I think by default it does 16,384 rounds of hashing, producing in the end a 512-bit value, which is used um, in two parts. Part of it is used to construct the chain code, and the other part is used to construct 
the master private key. And together, those two become an extensible master private key or XPRIV that forms the root of a tree of keys as defined by BIP 32. 39 defines how you construct a seed and a mnemonic phrase. It also says how you extend that mnemonic phrase in order to produce a root extensible master private key. It defines what an extensible master private key is and how you extend that master private key to produce children, subkeys, uh, as many subkeys as you want in a tree structure. It is the definition for hierarchical deterministic wallets. And then finally, BIP44 tells you how to arrange this tree of wallets in such a way as to create a structure that can be imported in a number of different compatible systems in a way that's understood. Now, you have this tree, and you have a master private key at the top, and it can have two billion children, uh, and two billion more hardened children derived from it. Each of those children can derive two billion of its own children, and two billion more hardened, and each of those children can derive two billion children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As you can imagine, if you don't know which part of the tree you're extending into, it's possible to find where you might be generating these keys. So, for consistency and interoperability within wallets, there is a standard defined under BIP43 and BIP44. BIP43 defines a purpose field, meaning that you pick a specific subkey of the master to identify what scheme you're using. And BIP44 defines a specific scheme under the 44th child key, the 44th hardened child key, um, that creates a structure for wallets. It defines a multi-coin type structure that allows you to store Ethereum, Dash, Monero, uh, Doge, uh, Zcash, and Bitcoin on the same hierarchical deterministic tree. Different branches, different children used for different cryptocurrencies. It also allows you within a single cryptocurrency to have sub-accounts. So if you're looking, for example, at your hardware wallet, you may notice that it has account zero, account one, account two, and you can create sub-accounts which have their own addresses, public keys, and their own transaction list. Again, that's a feature of BIP44, which is basically a particular scheme for dividing the space of the giant hierarchical deterministic tree in a way that makes sense, so that we know where is the Bitcoin, under which child is Bitcoin, under which child is Ethereum stored, um, where are the sub-accounts of Bitcoin, where are the sub-accounts of Ethereum, um, which addresses are used for receiving, which addresses are used for change, and all of that is defined by BIP44. So hopefully that answers your question about um, what BIP39, uh, BIP 32 and BIP 44 are. To recap, BIP 39, mnemonic phrases and how those convert to root, master, extensible private keys. BIP 32, how you go from a master extensible private key down to a whole tree, a hierarchical deterministic tree of keys. This is this known? BIP 43, how you give specific meaning to branches of that tree, and more importantly, BIP 44, or using the meaning um, in order to express a multi-currency, multi-account wallet that is broadly used within the system. Now, your wallet is probably compatible with 32, 39, and 44, which means that if you take a 24-word recovery phrase from your wallet and you import it into another wallet that is also BIP39, BIP32, and BIP44 compatible, it will find all of your currencies, all of your sub-accounts, all of your transactions, and all of your addresses, because it will use the exact same schemes. Finally, Alex, what are the odds that two different wallets might generate the same seed? 1 over 2 to the power of 128, which is a huge number. That means that even if you were doing quantillions of calculations per second, generating billions upon billions upon billions of independencies every second. The chances of 
and picking by random the same seed as someone else would not happen for billions upon billions upon billions of years uh, upon billions of people who are trying. So you just keep saying the word billions a lot, and that kind of creates an impression. We express the complexity of doing two to the one twenty eighth work in order to find a collision in that space. Two wallets generating the same seed for all practical purposes is impossible. And that means that you can generate thousands of seeds for yourself and not have to worry about that. The only chance that two different wallets will generate the same seed is um, very easily if their random number generator is not generating random numbers. So if both random number generators initialize in the same way and generate the same number, you've got the same seed. That's um, it's a flaw in the design of the random number generator. If you have a properly constructed, cryptographically secure uh, pseudo random number generator, a CSP uh, RNG, then it will generate a different seed each time, and two installations of it will generate different seeds if it's properly initialized, and the chance of generating the same seed none practically. All right. Andras asks, how can we uh, can we elaborate on what we really send and receive in a Bitcoin transaction? A Bitcoin address, based on what you said in lecture three, is a hashed public key, which is just data. When I send Bitcoin to an address, do I simply transfer the ownership of my unspent output to the entity who can present a public key that equals the same hash when double hashed, the same data when double hashed? So. When I send a transaction, does that simply include, among other things like the amount, my public key, and the double hashed public key of the receiving? What it includes specifically, address. It includes a list of inputs which um, identify which unspent outputs from a previous transaction you are spending. So it says from transaction with transaction ID X. The first output from transaction with transaction ID Y, the second output, and from transaction with transaction ID Z, the first output again. So that might be a transaction with three inputs. Maybe you had a lot of loose change lying around, and you need three inputs in order to make up the total amount you want to pay. Next to those three inputs, where each one is identified by the transaction ID and the index number of the unspent transaction output that you want to spend, that you are authorized to spend it. In this case, um, most likely that's going to be a public key, uh, which, when double hashed, produces the same data that these uh, previously unspent outputs uh, showed as their owner, and a signature that proves that you have the private key behind that public key. So, signature plus public key inputs the respect input X. Signature, public key. Input Y, signature, public key. Input Z, signature, public key. You sign each one of the inputs. That's the input side of the transaction. Pretty straightforward. There's a few other things in there that have to do with sequence numbers that are used for time locks and things like that for the time being. Um, and then on the other side of the transaction, uh, which is the to side, we've covered the from side now, the to side is a series of outputs. Um, let's say you have, as is standard in most transactions, two outputs. Maybe. They don't have to be in a specific sequence, but let's say the first output is a payment to the recipient that you're trying to pay. The output will have an amount in Satoshis. So outputs have amounts. Inputs don't have amounts. And the simple reason inputs don't have amounts is because if you have unspent outputs, UTXO, that you're spending, you spend them in their entirety. You can never divide them. So you take whatever change you have in UTXO, and you consume them. Their amount is defined in their original transaction. 
And on the output side, you say, here's the value, here's the amount in Satoshis, and here's who it's going to, and then you produce uh, what's known as a script pub key, which is the locking script for that output. And that locking script has something like produce a public key and signature corresponding to this double hash value. So as you said, the Bitcoin address. Effectively, it says pay so many Satoshis to this Bitcoin address. Um, that's called a pay to public key hash script or P2PKH. It's the most common type of script you see as a locking script in an output, and it simply means pay this Bitcoin address, which is the dull hash of a public key. And that's it, really. Uh, there's also some additional features in the transaction. There's a version number for the transaction, and there's a lock time, again, which is used for time locks. But most transactions will have a couple of inputs, your signatures that prove that you own those inputs, and a couple of outputs, one paying the Bitcoin address of the person you're trying to pay, and one paying the Bitcoin address of your change address for whatever change you might have. That's very common. Um, the change could be the first output, the payment could be the second. They don't have to be in a specific order. You might not have change, and you might be paying something other than a Bitcoin address. Maybe your transaction is paying a script hash, which might be a multi-sig, <clears throat> or it's paying a more complex script. Um, but most transactions have uh, two inputs, two outputs, one of which is change. John Mark asks, Hi Andreas, Bitcoin is supposed to be a bank and a smartphone, but Dell SecureWorks estimates that at least 140 different types of malware are active trying to hack mobile devices for wallets and private keys. I did not find any literature on how to guard against these malwares. Could you give some advice about this problem? Jean-Marc. The truth is that for most people, the most secure device they own is a smartphone. If you have a smartphone that is up to date with the latest version of the operating system from the manufacturer, for example, if you have an iPhone, um, it's kept up to date, or if you have an Android, it's on the latest version, and you maintain your updates, you use a PIN, and you use a wallet that is well built, well manufactured. So whoever has written the software for the wallet is using the smartphone's special encrypted storage area, the secure element, uh, as it's known on an iPhone, uh, or the trusted uh, security area, I think it's called on an Android, to store the keys, uh, uses correct encryption, and doesn't have any bugs and vulnerabilities. Then the truth is that it's, it's very difficult for malware money from your smartphone. We do see quite often, in fact, money stolen from poorly secured Windows machines that have Trojans and key loggers on them, resolved from people installing um, various bits of software that they find around the web. So if you have a Windows machine and you have a tendency to click on every toolbar and porn downloader and casino game, you will get 150 viruses on your Windows machine, and some of those viruses will steal your Bitcoin. That's inevitable. This, if you're careful with what you install, and you keep up to date with the security updates, and you run a, a, a well-reviewed, uh, popular, secure, well-built that has a lot of users and a lot of testing. Uh, the chances of someone stealing your Bitcoin off your smartphone with malware are very, very, very small. Now, of course, they're not zero, which is why I wouldn't carry on a smartphone than I'm willing to put as cash in my wallet, for example, when I'm walking down the street. For the rest, I don't consider my smartphone suitable for storing large amounts of Bitcoin. If I wanted to have, let's say, more than one Bitcoin, uh, in fact, right now, I wouldn't put more than half a Bitcoin on a smartphone. If I own more than half a Bitcoin, uh, I'm going to buy a hardware wallet, and I'm going to move my Bitcoin uh, to the hardware wallet. I maybe keep 
um, a couple of hundred dollars on my smartphone at most uh, if I've probably backed it up with a recovery phrase. And the rest would stay on a hardware wallet. And the reason for that is because a hardware wallet is a purpose-built device with very, very few interfaces not be attacked in any feasible manner from the outside. There may be attacks, of course, nothing is perfect, but um, by presenting a very, very narrow interface, and by ensuring that the keys only remain on this device whose only purpose is to keep your Bitcoin secure, it's the best way to handle any amount of Bitcoin that's more than, let's say, half a Bitcoin. And you can get hardware wallets, they're not that expensive. So I think the cheapest hardware wallet you can get is about uh, $25 um, for the Ledger HW1, or um, it can go up to $100, $120 for a Trezor, or if you want something fancier with a screen, like uh, a Ledger Blue or, or, or something like that, it might be more expensive. But even a very, very simple hardware wallet uh, is going to protect your Bitcoin against malware. That's how you do things with hardware, but also the other way you can protect yourself is by combining multiple different devices um, or multiple different forms of storage together in what we would call multi-sig, multi-factor. So multi-sig, most people assume, is used primarily when you want to have two people responsible for signing for a Bitcoin amount. But a different way to think of multi-sig is multi-sig where the keys are controlled by the same person but on different devices. So that's multi-factor multi-sig. Let's say, for example, that I have a multi-sig wallet and uh, one set of keys is controlled by my desktop. And I can do that, for example, with a Chrome application um, using, let's say, the Copay wallet. Uh, Copay is a great multi-sig wallet that I uh, use quite often. Um, let's say that I use that on my desktop, and then I also have Copay wallet on my smartphone. And I have a two of three with the third key uh, managed by my hardware wallet. Again, with Copay, uh, but with the key stored on a hardware wallet, let's say a letter. Now, it requires two signatures. My desktop has to sign, my smartphone has to sign, and if I lose my smartphone on my desktop, I can also use my hardware wallet on a different desktop, for example, uh, to produce a third signature for backup. I can also make backups of all of those three keys with mnemonic phrases. Now, then, even if there is malware on your device, they can compromise one device, maybe your desktop, but that's a different operating system from, say, the other device, which is your smartphone. The chances they can compromise both and apply signatures through a multi-signature process through both of those devices are pretty, pretty low. So there are ways to protect yourself. Um, and then Jean-Marc asks a follow-up question, which is, I created a web wallet on blockchain info and tried to make some transactions with my smartphone. I must say it was not easy at all, especially when you must jump from web menu to Google Authenticator and back to web menu. Do you have a better advice to use a smartphone for transactions rather than blockchain info? Um, yes, uh, I would use a wallet that is designed for your smartphone that conforms with BIP39, BIP32, and BIP44, where you can make a backup recovery phrase of uh, 24 words. Um, ones I like, but I don't necessarily recommend, but you can try out, and I would, I would advise you to try a number of them to see which one you're most comfortable. I like Copay because it does both multi-sig as well as single signature wallets, and you can have multiple different wallets, single signature and multi-signature combined on the same device. So, for example, you could have a petty cash wallet under Copay on your smartphone, and also one of the three keys of a multi-signature wallet that holds a bit more money. Um, I like uh, Bread Wallet on iOS, uh, Mycelium on Android. I like uh, for uh, novice users and with a lot more ease of use, I like AirBits on both Android um, and iOS. 
which has a different backup and security model, but is a bit easier for new users to use. So there's a lot of different, really good, high quality wallets nowadays that you can use. And I would prefer those uh, compared to a web wallet uh, like blockchain info, but that's a personal preference. Liliana asks, the general understanding is that the main advantage provided by the Bitcoin network is that it allows two parties to transact without a third party intermediary, such as a bank. However, we need Bitcoin clients or wallets to be able to send and receive Bitcoin. In my opinion, this is at least a three party model, and there is some intermediary service which is always required. In payment networks with four or more parties, but it's also an opportunity for big players to take over the key keeping and transaction processing by ensuring higher security and to earn money on payment processing. So is an intermediary service necessary from the end user perspective? And how does that take over for the development of Bitcoin wallets and clients? What is their role? How can you trust them? Yes, you need a Bitcoin client. Yes. Open source um, is the type of software that gives you the complete freedom to control your own money, to control your own keys. If you run a Bitcoin node software, for example, Bitcoin Core, uh, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin, or uh, BTCD, one of one of several different uh, types of core uh, compatible client node software. Uh, you can interact directly with the Bitcoin protocol from your own computer, your desktop, your server. Um, you can interact with the Bitcoin network. Your software will run the Bitcoin protocol, and you have complete control over which features you want to turn on or off. Um, there is absolutely no reason why you would give control over that. You can also download and install uh, very high quality, open source, free to use wallets from a variety of, uh, of uh, creators and teams. And these wallets are open, they are free, and they allow you to control your own keys. There is no reason why you would give control over your keys to an intermediary. So, the Bitcoin network gives you the option to operate without intermediaries, but a lot of people make the mistake and give up that option and give control to intermediaries. And what happens is eventually these intermediaries get hacked or these intermediaries commit fraud um, or a government steps in and confiscates their equipment or something else happens and you lose control over your money. Um, you can introduce third-party risk where no third party is necessary if you make that choice, but you don't have to make that choice. Bitcoin wallets, uh, hardware wallets, software wallets, and uh, the software of Bitcoin is getting easier to use and easier to secure for non-technical people every single day. No reason why you would give up that control to a third-party intermediary. Alex asks, Andreas, which wallet would you recommend for e-commerce websites with relatively large volumes? Alex, um, I would recommend that if you're using an e-commerce website, you separate the public keys from the private keys, and you only put the public keys on the website. You do not run live wallet software on a website, because if you do, uh, someone will hack into the website and steal. However, with hierarchical deterministic wallets uh, and various other technologies, you can very easily have a wallet on the website that only has public keys and can generate a unique public key for every shopping cart transaction, for every checkout, for every order, for every invoice, independently for each client. When they make payments to these public keys, uh, the money will flow to uh, a wallet that you can hold privately on a different device. Uh, it would be a hardware wallet, 
Um, and that would keep your Bitcoin very secure. The only way to spend would be from the hardware wallet, but your website could independently generate receiving addresses. There is a number of software agents that can do that for you. Um, there are also intermediary companies. Uh, so you can certainly hire a third party to do that for you, but the problem is then you are not using Bitcoin. Bank that happens to operate with Bitcoin, um, and that's a third party service. Uh, probably one of the interesting software in this space is, is a project called Mycelium Gear. Mycelium, which means mushroom in Latin, uh, M Y C E L I U M. Gear. Mycelium Gear is a software package that allows you to install. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. That allows you to install uh, an extensible public key e-commerce website and generate the public keys for doing uh, Bitcoin processing. You can do very simple things like, like simply a button, uh, click here to pay, create um, simple invoices and things like that for you. And, uh, get a hardware wallet, uh, generate keys on the hardware wallet, write down your backup recovery phrase, and then you can tell your hardware wallet software to show you the extensible public key only public key, you plug it into your mycelium gear on your website, and you have an e-commerce solution. There are other solutions out there that do something similar. You can do that with Electrum, for example. Electrum has a solution for e-commerce websites. Um, and there are certainly a number of companies that can do something very similar to that, but you have to trust them because they process your Bitcoin. With the solutions I just described, uh, nobody is a third party in your transaction. Uh, nobody else processes your Bitcoin. Let's see if we have any more questions from any more questions from the forums. Let's see. Uh, we've got one more question from session three. This is from the previous session. A quick follow-up. Uh, Nicola asks, reward. Why is it that not everyone involved in the process gets some reward according to their contribution? And if the winner takes all and winning is based on pure luck, why is it not a lottery and not an investment? Is this rule about mining rewards something that all participants agree upon too? Yes, it is a consensus rule. The consensus algorithm in Bitcoin is a winner-take-all system. Uh, you can use a mining pool, and you can even use an open mining pool, a decentralized mining pool like P2 pool, uh, to uh, share the winning so that um, participants in the pool get shares according to the work that they contribute to the mining pool. And, and certainly, there are many other uh, mining pools that run as cooperatives or commercial endeavors. You can contribute your hashing power. However, that gives some power to the mining pool operator. Uh, using P2 pool, you don't give any power to the mining pool operator. However, this is the rule. Uh, the consensus algorithm within Bitcoin imposes a winner-takes-all system. Alternative. Um, to this called the ghost mechanism for mining. And ghost is based on the idea that um, blocks that find lower difficulty results um, can also get part of the reward, and the reward is shared. Um, that, as far as I know, has not been used in any other cryptocurrency. It was a proposed protocol to make mining uh, more fair. Um, and it does provide some advantages over our mining pools, but that's not how Bitcoin works. The consensus rules uh, do not allow that application. Um, so at the moment, the alternative is to use uh, mining pools. All right, and. We have one more question from this session. Can one store cryptocurrency in a wallet for a long time? How possible is it to store Bitcoins for the long term, given the dynamic nature of this technology and the fast 
pace of changes. You could store Bitcoin from the very first year of Bitcoin's operation and spend it in a fully compatible transaction today without any problem. You could spend Bitcoin that was mined in the first hundred blocks and it would be spendable today in a standard transaction. Bitcoin is always compatible in such a way, so far, um, that if something was spendable in the past, it is still spendable today. Part of the ethos in Bitcoin is to not make changes that make perfectly good unspent coins, or forcing users who have stored Bitcoin long term to have to move or change something about their long term storage. Uh, storing Bitcoin means storing keys. Keys are just numbers. If you store the numbers, those numbers are still good. You can still use them to do signatures. You may have to go through some kind of process to import those keys into whatever wallet we're using today, um, but that's generally not very difficult. That can help you do that, but you can usually do that yourself quite easily. Uh, if you have a private key that corresponded to a Bitcoin address for an amount of Bitcoin that was received or mined back in 2009, uh, you could import that private key into any of the modern wallets um, and then make a transaction and spend that Bitcoin right away. No problem whatsoever, and that's eight years later. Uh, so yes, it is absolutely possible to store Bitcoin long term. Um, I have stored uh, Bitcoin keys years uh, or more on paper wallets in the past, small amounts from the beginning uh, when I bought small amounts of Bitcoin. And I stored them untouched, and then three years later, I moved them to a hardware wallet or I moved them to a different wallet. No problem at all. Um, so for Bitcoins for the long term, uh, and even on some of the technology platforms. So, for example, if you take um, a hardware wallet today that's based on some of the prevailing standards, BIP 39, 32, 44, and you write down your backup recovery phrase, and you um, use that Bitcoin wallet to receive Bitcoin, and you store it in that hardware wallet, it uh, will probably last many, many, many years untouched, as long as it's not damaged by water or, or a fire or something like that. The static bag and put it in a bank vault. Uh, uh, an unpowered hardware wallet will probably last easily uh, more than a decade. Um, whether you'll find a USB plug to plug it in in 10 years, that may be a bit more difficult. Um, but Here's the thing, it doesn't matter, because if you wrote your backup recovery phrase on paper, laminated that paper and put it in a vault, um, then you can reconstruct the software, and I guarantee you, you will find open source software to import a BIP39 seed and sweep a wallet a decade, simply by providing the 24 words. And honestly, pencil on paper, is probably one of the most durable technologies you can have. If you use acid-free paper and you laminate it, that stuff can last for decades uh, without any degradation and still be readable decades later. Uh, question: Is there a wallet that can hold keys for both Bitcoin and Ethereum? Yes. BIP44, which is one of the standards we discussed earlier, is a multi-currency standard. Um, any cryptocurrency that is based on um, some form of elliptic curve cryptography that is either similar to Bitcoin's or can be based off of keys that are of 256 bits in length. Um, and you can build wallets that can do all of the derivation and have multiple currencies in one wallet. So uh, many hardware wallets, many software wallets that use the BIP44 standard can store Bitcoin. And Ethereum and Classic and Dash and um, all kinds of other cryptocurrencies in a single wallet, all of which are backed up by a single 24 word backup recovery phrase um, and stored in a single wallet.
Question, is there any way in the future to reproduce lost bitcoins to eventually maintain the 21 million total bitcoin um, in production totals? Uh, no, there is no way to reproduce lost, lost bitcoins, because in most cases, in, in all cases, in fact, bitcoin isn't lost. It's still there on the blockchain. What's lost is the keys. And um, reproducing the keys simply means stealing Bitcoin from someone because you don't know if they're around, if they have the keys stored in a vault, and they're just not telling anyone. You can't take Bitcoin just because you can figure a way to break their keys, um, or at least you can't ethically do that. Um, so there's no reproducing lost Bitcoin. Bitcoin isn't lost. It's sitting right there on the blockchain. You just don't have the keys. Maybe someone does. Maybe no one does. Nobody knows. Um, but that's good news, and it's good news for a very simple reason. Every amount of Bitcoin that is lost out of the less than 21 million total that will ever be produced becomes a gift to the rest of the Bitcoin economy. By reducing the total supply of Bitcoin, the value of all of the other Bitcoin in circulation goes up because there's less supply uh, and the same amount of demand. So taking Bitcoin out of circulation because you lose it, because you lost the keys, really. Um, is basically the same as if you took that, divided it among all of the other Bitcoin that exists, and gave it as a gift in equal amounts to all of the other Bitcoin holders. So go ahead, lose your keys. It will be a gift to the rest of us who keep our keys more securely and remember to write down our backup phrases. I think that may have been the last question for the day. One more. Oh, great follow-up question. Does that mean that if I remember my 24 words, I can delete my keys, and when I need them, simply regenerate the tree? It acts as a pin code. It's better than a pin code. The backup phrase is your keys. The backup phrase is the entire tree of keys. If you remember those 24 words, if you have them written down, if you keep that backup recovery phrase, you can then delete hardware wallet or software wallet, whatever that thing is backing up. As long as you keep one or more copies of those key of those backup recovery phrase words. Um, and you have those. You can use any compatible software any time in the future to recover every transaction, every account, and every currency that was stored on that system. Words are your keys. Um, and even if you had a PIN number on your hardware wallet, that PIN number is only for accessing the hardware wallet. It's not tied to the recovery. If when you make your recovery phrase, you add an optional passphrase, you must remember that passphrase, because then the backup words plus your passphrase are your keys, and you need both. Uh, just the backup recovery words are your keys, and you can recover them on any compatible wallet anytime you want. Your Bitcoin is safe on a piece of paper, as well as every other currency you've stored. And I think we'll leave the next question about user-activated soft forks for a future session, because we have only 10 minutes, and that's probably a one-third of a session type question, um, and more appropriate from when we discuss things like hard and soft forks and updates to Bitcoin. And with that, we're done with our fourth session for the massive open online course for the master's degree in digital currencies at the University of Nicosia. This is Andreas Antonopoulos. As always, a pleasure answering your questions. I expect this week to answer more of your questions. In the meantime, discuss amongst yourselves, do your homework, read the material, pose questions, discuss the questions among yourselves, come up with better and more questions, see if you can find the answers, and then I will be answering whatever is left over next week. Um, thank you so much for paying attention to this. Thank you for your great questions this week. Take care.